Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dreamcatcher podcast, a place where your dreams can find a voice. Many of us live our lives living on autopilot and distracted, not noticing all the beautiful sights, sounds, and smells that enrich our lives. One way to become more aware of our surroundings is through the practice of mindfulness. It's a type of meditation in which you become intensely aware of what you're feeling and thinking in the moment without any judgment. My guest today, Sonata Takagi, has been practicing and teaching the art of mindfulness for many years now. Sonata is a mindfulness instructor, teacher, and coach. She inspires people to build purpose-centered lives through the power of mindfulness. Her compassionate coaching guides an inner discovery process that leads her students to confident steps in new directions. In this interview, Sonata is going to be introducing us to the basics of a mindfulness practice and how we and our planet can benefit from it. She'll also offer advice to those who have difficulty meditating. And if you like what you heard, please don't forget to like, rate, share, and subscribe to this podcast. Thanks. Hello, Sonata. How are you doing today? Hi, Celine. I'm great, thank you. Great. I am so happy to be connecting with you today, not only because of your expertise in mindfulness, but also because you have a pretty interesting story. (laughs) Thank you. Yes, I'm honored to be here. Right. And uh, I feel, you know, judging from your lot of interesting things to talk about today. So thank you for being here. Oh, It's an honor. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay, so Sonata, I'd like to start um, talking about your background. Mm -hmm. You were born in Tokyo, Japan, and your your family immigrated to the United States when you were very little. Three three years old. Three years old. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, So I would love to know what experiences were like and if you remember Mm -hmm. anything. To the United States and how Not your really. culture. Um, yeah, yeah. So even though I don't remember much of the move itself, um, mm-hmm. I grew up in a Japanese family. I had to speak Japanese when I was at home. And so I grew up kind of culturally Japanese, even though I, I grew up here in the States. And mm-hmm. um, so, you know, I grew up bilingual and bicultural. And uh, just recently, something dawned on me that I found really interesting was that um, I noticed that um, holidays here in America, um, most of them are about celebrating wars and not celebrating wars, you know, commemorating wars and political events. Yeah, uh-huh. you know, Veterans Day, Memorial Day, Memorial Day sure. um, Independence Day, right? They're, they're often uh-huh. about those kinds of things. And right. it's interesting when I noted that in Japan, we have um, not all, but many of the holidays are celebrations of nature. So, for yeah. example, it's a national holiday on the first day of spring in March, and people get the day off. And it's a national pastime to go out and and enjoy the cherry blossoms when they're in full bloom, which is glorious. Um, In July, there's also a holiday called Ocean Day. And again, you get the day off to go and um, appreciate the blessings that the ocean has brought to an island nation. So I just wanted to say that, to, to say that there's, in Japan, there's just a really deep, spiritually oriented respect for nature and Mm -hmm. our relationship to it. And um, there's also a real sense of valuing harmony and community, which is sort of an extension of this um, valuing of nature. Mm -hmm. So in contrast to here in the States, which is just so I, I found that oh, yeah. that contrast to be really interesting to note. And, and so I was influenced by that in my upbringing. Yeah. Okay, so that's I, so interesting. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's made me value community and service and living in harmony with the natural world. Right. And that is something that you incorporate into, into your workshops and the coaching that you do. 
I wouldn't say explicitly, but it's sort of an underlying ethos, if you, if I can put it that way. It's okay. Sort of my worldview. It's not necessarily anything I would bring up explicitly, but it gives right. you a sense of what my perspective is. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I actually visited Japan two years ago, and I definitely could sense that that harmony and that rev that sort of reverence. Reverence. Of, yes, that's a good yes. word for it. Yeah. Yeah, I could sense that, like visiting the Shinto temples and everything, and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was just such a beautiful feeling. I felt so welcome there, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's very gentle and respectful. Absolutely, absolutely. Of those kinds of things. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so now let's get into into uh, the meat of the interview, which is okay, sure. mindfulness. Um, yeah, so yeah. you say that mindfulness is at the heart of everything that you do and that you aim to transform lives uh, by teaching this practice. So why don't you start by telling us how, how does mindfulness transform one's lives? Yeah. So I think a lot of people come to meditation and mindfulness um, initially because they feel like they want to fix something in their lives, right? It's very mm -hmm. common for people to start meditating because they're dealing with anxiety or depression or, or just general stress. I would say those yeah. are the most common things that come up when people come to a meditation class. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I sense that there's sort of a bit of a medical model at play here. It's like something's, I've got these symptoms and I need to do something, you know, kind of take these drugs, if you will, to fix the symptoms. And a lot of people, I think, approach meditation that way. And I don't think that's necessarily wrong. Um, for, for some people, that's all they're looking for, and they get it, and they, they move on, and that's great. Um, but I think that's kind of a limited view. And mm -hmm. I think mindfulness and meditation are not like prescription drugs. Yes. And you they're not quick fixes. They're, they're like a lifestyle. And they're not predictable either. You know, it's not like okay. this input creates that output. Mm -hmm. um, so people will say, well, if I meditate, how many days and for how long do I have to meditate before I'm going to feel better? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. You know, it's not <laughs> a medical treatment. And not only that, it's much more than a medical treatment, actually. So... Um, to get a sense of what I think mindfulness can do, Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what if, imagine that I, I said you could have a new pair of glasses that allowed you to see things much more clearly and with more sensitivity than before. And I'm not just talking about visual details, but, you know, things like being able to read people's emotions or sense mm -hmm. the quality of their energy. So you just become a more sensitive observer of people and things. Right. Um, or imagine that you could have something that expanded the capacity of your mind mm -hmm. um, to be more intuitive and insightful and make more creative connections between thoughts and ideas. Uh, maybe uh, having stronger convictions about what you know is the right thing to do in a certain situation and, and also to, to feel um, the courage to stand up for something, even though it's a little bit daunting to try it. Um, those are all the kinds of qualities that if you practice mindfulness, those traits become more, well, they, they get strengthened in mm -hmm. us. So I'm not necessarily saying that if you meditate 20 minutes a day, you're going to get this. Because obviously, as I said before, you, you can't predict exactly. Yeah, and I, I think that people are at different levels, right? There are some people who exactly. have their mental chatter is like out of control. And there are some people exactly. who are more, more laid back. And exactly. yeah, you know, they have different temperaments. So I can, I can yeah. understand. Yeah. But I brought those illustrations up to just give a sense of the kinds of directions that um, meditation and mindfulness can take you. So it's fixing symptoms. It's really about 
um, building a stronger personal foundation in a much more holistic sense so that if you are dealing with anxiety or depression or stress, you just are better resourced to deal with them, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, think, I think the other thing that happens with mindfulness is, um, well, I, I really feel like everyone has some deeper part within us that knows what makes you come alive you know what you know what what you need to make life feel more meaningful for you intuitively and that part of us is bigger than our problems right um, your problems don't define you and so there's there's a resourced part of us that we can rely on that that um, is so much bigger than your problems. And um, well, some people might call that Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. Some people might call that your inner guru, um, maybe your soul, I don't know. Um, I use those terms cautiously because they all mean slightly different things and have different connotations, sure. but, mm -hmm. but they're all, you kind of sense what they're all pointing to, right? It's, it's a, it's some part of us that's bigger than our problems. Mm -hmm. It's some pure, authentic part of us that just knows, just knows what we need and uh, what's the right thing to do in, in any situation. So a lot of my work is about helping people to reconnect with that part of themselves in a much more holistic sense of who you are, not just fixing this problem or that problem. Right. Um, so, you know, your, your symptoms actually may not go away. You know, you may not actually resolve the anxiety, depression, stress, whatever. We're all going to have mm -hmm. stressful lives, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's just, it's just it, something you have to, you have to manage. And it sounds like mindfulness yeah. is a tool that you can use to, to manage it. Well, it's more than a tool. It, it just helps you to become more resourced, to be able to be Res in a healthy... Resourced. Yeah, okay. so that you can be in a better relationship with the problems in your life, mm -hmm. right? That they don't define me. They don't have to drive me because I actually know how to handle this, right? I can get through it this. Is it because you're able to create that distance between you and yeah. the problem? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that you can so. Be able That's a start. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And and the practice of meditation helps you to, to start to do that. You know? Okay. In the same way that, you know, a fish doesn't recognize that it's swimming in water, but but maybe a fish meditates yes. and start realizing that they are in water, you know. They are in water, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Is mindfulness, I mean, what is the difference between mindfulness and meditation? I mean, there, mindfulness is a type of meditation, right? Yes, you could put it that way. Or okay. the way I prefer to look at it is... Meditation is something you do, mm -hmm. and mindfulness is the quality you bring to the experience of what you're doing. Okay. Right. You're being, you're being mindful when you sit and meditate. So I think mindful, oh, sorry about that. So I think mindfulness is this, uh, the water <laughs> that the fish is swimming in, but yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's the, the quality of mind that you bring. That's, that's, um, uh, paying attention, consciously aware of what's uh -huh. going on. So could you be mindful doing pretty much anything? Do you have yeah. to be meditating? Like, could I be going for a run and getting into Absol that, that state Absolutely. of mindfulness? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. So the, the ideal would be that we're mindful every single moment of our lives. Mm. I mean, I don't want to make that, you know, you're, you should be doing this. I'm not, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that, that this is something we need to do, but it is possible 
to be mindful, mm -hmm. even when you're in pain or if you're in an argument with your partner or, you know, in a really difficult situation, you can still be aware, notice what's going on, um, recognizing if I'm being triggered, for example, and restrain mm, myself. Hard. Yeah, <laughs> that's really hard. You know, restrain yeah. myself from shooting off at the mouth. You know, that's all being part of being mindful and being self-aware. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for explaining that for us. Yeah. That, that really does make it clear, make, makes it really clear about what it's all about. Yeah. Um, and what I find interesting is that you're also an ordained Buddhist minister. And I understand that your work is highly informed by, by what you learned. Um, yeah. So I'd love to know, um, does the Buddhist perspective on mindfulness differ from how it's, uh, how it's popularly understood today? Yeah, yes. And um, it sort of reflects what I talked about earlier, where many people tend to approach meditation as, you know, symptom relief. Um, I think many people... Um, yeah, come to meditation and mindfulness trying to solve their problems and then think that the, the practice of formal meditation is the prescription drug that they have to take, so to speak. Yeah, um, and I think it's also because the way they position it, like when you read about it in articles, it's like one of the things that they suggest you should do. It's like, a, it's what's recommended for people who are suffering from... I think yeah. that's probably yeah. why they come, yes. come up to you and say, you know, like, yes. fix me. <laughs> and, and that's an access point for a lot of people. And that's great, you know, because yeah. meditation yeah, that is, is now yeah. reaching, reaching people who otherwise might never have even considered it. So correct. Yes. in the sense of reaching a wider audience, I think it's great. Um, but what, what I find um, sad is when it just gets limited to that. Because because mindfulness mm. and meditation is so much more so much than more that. yeah so much more than that so the Buddhist perspective is that mindfulness is not just you know twenty minutes a day on your cushion um, it's not a <laughs> technique right <laughs> yeah um, it's actually a lifelong practice that you can engage with every minute of the day, every moment of your life. And it's really about getting to know yourself better and get to know your mind better in particular. You know, how my mind works, you know, how it gets stuck, where I get triggered. Those are all the kinds of things that specifically can be really helpful um, to begin to know ourselves better, right? Um, but it's not just knowing our problems and our negative sides, but also how do I keep myself inspired and motivated, mm. right? You know, there's that side of it's important too. Um, cause in, in Buddhism, you know, the whole idea here is how do we keep reaching higher to become a better person, if you will, become reaching your real potential as a human being. And not just floating through life and like work a day lives, earning a living and raising kids and nothing wrong with that. But, you know, do you want that, you know, just the day to day details of life to just consume you? You know, is that enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so it's like, it's like getting out of that rat race and really just taking a moment to take it all in and really think yeah. about what's going on and where, where you want to go. And so having a sense, uh, having a sense of purpose, you know? Yes. Yes. By the way, your, your screen has disappeared, so I'm not seeing you anymore. Oh, really? I'm just mm, seeing a microphone odd. icon. The Buddhist scriptures, to go back to Buddhism and, and its perspective on mindfulness, um, some of the key aspects of mindfulness that it talks about is not just about being in the present moment. Um, yes, that's part of it, but that's only a, a part of it. And um, there's, there's a quality that never gets mentioned in our popular understanding of mindfulness. And the Sanskrit word for that is sampajana, 
Mm -hmm. And it means something like clear comprehension or mindfulness of purpose, which, by the way, is where the name of my coaching business comes from. Ah. Right? So the implication is that we're not just aware of what's happening now, but we're also aware of the bigger context of what the role now plays in where I want to get to. So, you know, we're not just a bunch of random present moments <laughs> floating yeah. in the ocean, vast ocean of present moments. Just you There's know, some connectivity. <laughs> there's some connectivity and that we yeah. actually have some say in the direction that those present moments can take us mm -hmm. um, and that we actually have some um, capacity to point ourselves in a direction that feels more important and meaningful to us. And that's the point of being mindful mm -hmm. is not just to enjoy the present moment and feel good, but to direct ourselves in a direction that's ultimately going to be more positive for us going forward. Hmm. So, so it makes us more example. intentional. It makes us more exactly. intentional about exactly. the things that we do. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let me give you an example, just a personal example. Sure. Um, yeah. So I, I am an overachiever type. It's total <laughs> type A, right? I used to be a total workaholic. And yeah. everything I do, I just have to do at my absolute best, um, which I suppose can be an admirable quality. It certainly is in the world out there. Yeah. Um, but it's gotten me into a lot of trouble, as you can imagine, yeah. mostly in terms of the effect on my own health. Mm -hmm. um, and I just have a tendency to take on too much, to overdo, and then I end up with you know, exhaustion, chronic fatigue, you name it, you know, that's, it's been the source of all of my health issues. So I've spent a lot of time with my mindfulness practice, just noticing what are the thoughts coming up for me behind my compulsion to just do more, more, and more, and more. And I realized that, you know, a lot of it is just wanting approval. But I think mm. deep down inside, which I think many of us have, but I think deep down inside, there's part of me that felt like I have to earn my right to be here, you know, that I don't have the right to That's exist. That's profound. Now, right? Mm. And that I somehow yeah. have to pay my dues to be allowed to breathe or something. It sounds totally foolish to say it out loud. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. But I think that. a lot of people can relate yeah. to that. And I feel mm -hmm. like I have to do something to earn my place in the world. You know, so what and you realized... you were able to understand that once you started uh, the practice of mindfulness and then you were. Yeah. 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 And so a lot of my practice, you know, for many people, um, reaching for something more means pushing themselves harder. And for me, it's the mm -hmm. exact opposite. For me. Yeah. Reaching for more means doing less. Yeah. And that's a real challenge for an overachiever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you and, know? and you know, just because people perceive passivity to be a weakness. It's like if you're not doing anything, then you're not going anywhere. You know, you're not exactly. making progress. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I mean about it becoming a, you know, like a life practice. It's not just what you do on the cushion. And, and that's what the Buddhist perspective on mindfulness is. You know, it's not just this 20 minutes a day or going on a retreat on a weekend, which is good and helpful, not to knock it, of course. That's not yeah. the whole picture. You know, you need to string all those moments together mm -hmm. into um, a life direction, if you will. Right. Right. And Sonata, what if people want to start doing formal meditation? What if they do want to get on that cushion 20 minutes a day, um, but they feel in discouraged, you know, they feel like it's not working and, you know, their mind goes all over the place. And uh, <laughs> I get it. I get just to let you know, I'm included in that category, in this category. Yeah. So what advice do you have for people like me and 
everyone else yeah. who, who faces this issue. Well, let me just say that that's very common. I can't, yeah. I've tried so many times. <laughs> just, yeah. yeah. I can't do it. <laughs> I get it. I get it. And some people just have a really hard time sitting still and it, yeah. it, you just get antsy and uncomfortable and I just, you know, I, I want to get up and I'm too restless. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So then um, can we just try a little experiment? Can I, can I try like a two, three minute meditation just to demonstrate something? Would that sure. be okay? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. So. I won't even call this a meditation. Let's let's just try an experiment here, okay? Okay. So um, I'd like you to just look at what's in front of you, which I imagine for you is like a computer screen or something. But, yes, you know, it is. Yeah. So just take a look. Just open your eyes and notice what's in front of you right now. Okay. And imagine that your eyes are like a camera lens. And by that, I mean, you know, camera lenses don't go out and reach for visual stimulation. They just accept whatever is landing on the lens. So taking okay. that, that sort of um, mindset, just allow your eyes to take in the visual display in front of you. You might notice colors and shapes, and I bet you're seeing details that you really hadn't paid much attention to until now. Yeah. Yep. But there they are, right? There's, you know, we're not judging anything as being good or bad. They just are. There they are. So just being curious to see what, what's here. And we can do the same thing with our ears. So imagine that your ears are the hearing equivalent of a camera lens. So, and if it helps to close your eyes, you can do that. But just notice what's coming in through your, the camera lens, so to speak, of your ears. Mm -hmm. And so there are sounds. And you might be thinking, well, I'm in silence. There's nothing there. But is that true? You might be hearing the fan of your computer or um, maybe you're hearing some traffic noise outside or somebody's in another room and you can hear them moving around or right? so just allowing all of those sounds to land on your ears. And now we can do the same thing with our bodies. Just notice what's coming into your body. What, what sensations do you notice? Feeling the chair under you? Feeling the, the sensation of your, of your bottom sinking into the cushion of your chair? Feeling clothing against your skin? Feeling your breath? Like, how, how can you tell that you're breathing? Ask yourself, how do I know I'm breathing? So, so we can pause there. Mm -hmm. So notice I didn't say, try to relax, try to do something, try to get somewhere. I just asked you what's happening right now. Right. And we just allow ourselves to be curious about what's happening right now. And I'd like to ask you how you feel right now. Oh, I feel really relaxed. There you go. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, I mean it. <laughs> yeah. It's that yeah. simple. And mm. anybody can do it. Um, our, our whole society has trained us to be very goal oriented about everything we do. And we only mm -hmm. do things to make to make something happen or try and get somewhere. No, we're just seeing what's here. Right. And allowing that to inform. And would this work when we feel like 
there's something that we really want to control in our lives, like a certain outcome or like there's something that we really want to happen. Mm. Can we, can mindfulness kind of take us out of that space where we get really constricted and kind of like, <laughs> Oh, I want this to happen. Like, why is it not happening? You know? Cause... Yeah. Yeah. So it, there's, there's an interesting um, situation because well, obviously, we all have those situations. I can relate to it with with my own health issues. You know, if okay. if you're in pain over something, you, you're not just going to let it be. You know, you, you're going to yeah. go see a doctor. You're going to try and get better. So, how does mindfulness apply here? Well, I can notice in the moment if I'm just getting so grabby about what I want that it's making me tense. And making me anxious. Yeah. And that's that's totally unnecessary. So, okay, breathe. I can drop those thoughts, right? That's not helpful. What's something actually helpful that I can do in this moment? Okay, I can call my doctor and make an appointment. Check. I'll do that. Once I've made the appointment and the thoughts start going, am I dying? Do I have cancer? No, that's not helpful. And until I get to my doctor, there's nothing I can do. So let's just let it go. Mm -hmm. right? So reaching that state of surrender, basically. In that moment, after you've done moment. everything that you possibly you can, can yeah. then mm -hmm. anything more that you know keeps the brain <laughs> Uh, circling round and round. Yeah. So it just makes you more pragmatic mm -hmm. about what, what you can do realistically, mm -hmm. and then let the rest go. Let the rest go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Thank you so much. Cause that's something that I, I find myself getting into a lot and I'm sure like other people do as well. Yeah. And, um, and that is the paradox of this kind of practice, because it sounds like how can you be in the present moment and, and try and get somewhere at the same time? They, they seem sure. to be opposing things, but they're not. Yeah. Cause right now is part of the flow of getting somewhere and, and what you do in this moment has an impact mm -hmm. on what happens in your future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Yeah. And um, you mentioned on your website that your personal mission is to help people find their inner strengths so that they can bring out their best selves to a world in dire need. So could you please tell us how you believe that mindfulness can help people become more aware of the impact that they have on others and in their community? Yeah, so that's another paradoxical situation, isn't it? Because yeah. it sounds like mindfulness and meditation is about all this inner work and, and looking mm -hmm. within. So how does it relate to, you know, your larger world around you? Well, um, if you're really hoping to uh, live a more meaningful life, to be more uh, fulfilled, happy, I don't know, whatever words you want to put on it. Um, uh, you've probably noticed that if you spend all your energy just on yourself and my own needs, then it probably means that you're not paying attention, enough attention to your job, your partner, your kids, what have you. All those things start falling apart and you end up in trouble here because you're not mm -hmm. engaging with life around you. So we're not all islands and we don't just live in our own little bubbles and to really honestly live uh, happily and meaningfully um, it's not just about me feeling better about myself although that's obviously important but equally important is how can i be in harmony how can i bring myself in more harmony with the people around me not just the people but just you know everything, the whole world. Mm -hmm. And I feel like our whole world is at that kind of crisis point where right. we have all sort of taken this idea of doing my, my own thing as far as it can go. And 
if we're going to deal with these huge issues like climate change, racial injustice, you name it, all of these are so much bigger than anything any one individual can do. Mm-hmm. And, and so where I see mindfulness really playing a picture is not just about dealing with my own stuff, but getting to know how I can be in a more effective relationship with the people around me and, and my world and the earth and nature, right? So um, I think everything in, in Buddhism is about serving our higher good, not just for myself, not just my own interests, but as I was saying, just to really know and understand my relationship mm-hmm. with the world, my place in the world, what I can genuinely contribute to it, how I can live in harmony with it, right? Which in the end is going to make me happier, right? Yes. It kind of yes. comes back full circle. So um, it, it isn't just about me and, and this, yeah. and um, paradoxically, by taking better care of myself internally yeah. ends up ultimately yeah, helping me to didn't feel Ga- connected. Yeah, didn't Gandhi say, "Be the change you wish to see in the yeah, world"? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's that's uh, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, and and yeah. you know, I, I understand that because it's just by changing your own personal vibration, you kind of emanate, you know, that that positive energy into the collective consciousness, and then in that way, you are, you yes. are contributing to that that paradigm shift that's i guess it's trying to happen (laughs) yes Uh, yes just through your own example if nothing else yes you know if you can be the one calm person in a sea of totally wigged out people you're having an influence yeah absolutely and that's something that you try to do through your work clearly (laughs) and and hopefully you know helping others to to take similar stances as well in the work that they do so i don't try and channel people into social justice for example that's not my role but whatever Mm -hmm. they choose to do if they choose to be mothers full-time or Mm -hmm. or work in a corporate job it it really doesn't matter what they choose to do but if Mm. if they can do it in a way that is with this kind of um conscious and conscious appreciation of living in harmony Yeah. And that's all good, right? Yeah. It's yeah. all good. It's all it's good. All good. And I'm, it's all yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that people like you will inspire us to to get into that that kind of presence and that state of mind where we can be able to contribute in, in whatever way we can. So so thank you for that, Sonata. I really believe that. All right, Sonata, it's been so nice talking to you. Thank you so much for uh, being here and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, You know, it's been such a delight to speak with you and learn more about, uh, you know, this beautiful practice of mindfulness. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you. All right, so the best place to learn more about Sonata and the coaching services and classes that she provides is her website, which is mindfulpurpose.com. You can find the direct link in the description. Is there anything else you would like to add to that, Sonata? Um, I'll, I'll just say that because I do all of my coaching online, it doesn't matter where you are. I have co- clients um, not in the U S you know, I have international clients as well. As long as we can coordinate our time schedules, it doesn't matter. So, um, I'm, I'm very happy to, to speak with anyone who kind of shares my aspirations about being a force for good in the world. Wonderful. 